Right, hello. Hello and welcome to this presentation on the battle for content. I think what you're probably expecting to hear a bit about is content strategies um, across the industry. What I thought I might do, though, over the next 15 minutes is to talk a little bit more about our own experiences as a platform, what's worked for us and what hasn't. And in specific, I want to offer four key insights of if, let's say, if we were to start again, or if you were a new platform, what are the types of things you would focus on in, in terms of acquiring content? And that should give some good insight for some Q&A later on. So I don't want to talk too much about uh, the market as a, as a whole, but as we know, it's highly, highly converged. And there's really just two points I would make about that, which is, firstly, there's clearly many different ways that you can win in the, ca in the battle for content, that you can position content, because there's so many different operators and platforms that are out there and succeeding. Um, and I think the second point, just to uh, coming on to TalkTalk, Talk, is that because there's so much convergence, it's important that everyone has to have their own differentiated angle. And um, I'll just talk a little bit more about how we've been successful in content. Um, we have 1.4 million TalkTalk Talk, uh, TV homes, um, and consistently we've been the fastest growing TV service in the UK. Um, for those that aren't in the UK, TalkTalk Talk is a triple play, now quad play platform. So we offer broadband, telephony, internet, and mobile. When it comes to how we approach content since we've launched our box two and a half years ago, one of the key, I'll talk a little bit about some of the key TalkTalk Talk areas and specifically what that translated to for how we acquired content and then some lessons for the future. Uh, the first area is that we knew we had to adhere to the basics of TalkTalk, Talk, which is making Britain, Britain better off. In the uh, UK landscape, TalkTalk Talk is the value provider for broadband. And so that's something that we wanted to continue with at TalkTalk uh, Talk Talk TV. So obviously low price was very important. An area where we wanted to uh, differentiate in the market was flexibility. So can we offer low-cost monthly packs as opposed to long-term subscription offerings? And that's an area that we've been really focused on. In terms of our target audience, in the UK, um, pay TV and free-to-air is, is roughly split half and half. And so where we've targeted all our efforts is in targeting Freeview customers. So those are customers who aren't accustomed to paying for content. And what's been quite interesting is consistently throughout our two and a half years of growth, it's really been free view audiences that have been taking our services as opposed to people spinning down from more expensive premium pay TV providers. And um, again, on the value mantra, what we've tried to do is ensure that uh, we uh, look to acquire content and work with content partners as opposed to going out and um, purchasing our own expensive sports rights or producing our own content. And again, from a value perspective, that's uh, where we uh, sit. But one of our long-term visions, so in conclusion, what that means is our long-term vision is to be a content marketplace. So exclusivity, as I'll talk about later, is less of a key factor. And as part of that content marketplace, we want to showcase the best of content linear, which is still extremely important. And in our viewing stats, the most predominant way that our audience watch content, on demand, catch up, VOD, EST, all those windows. Uh, and we've recently acquired a company called Blinkbox in January, which will also help us to achieve some of those aims. So onto those four points uh, that I mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to share a bit more about the battle for content and what we would do again and what we're doing um, is really to pose four uh, questions. I suppose the first question is, it's great getting the content, but how are you going to package and how are you going to, what's your proposition? And I think that's been really real key learning. The second question really is, is it enough if you're a content platform or buyer to simply license content? And conversely, if you're a content seller or distributor, is it enough just to send the digital files and sign the contract? So I'll talk a bit more about that. The third area sounds really, really simple, but uh, I can't stress enough. And I think that's an area where a lot of platforms and operators maybe go headlong in pursuit of content without thinking, actually, are you licensing the right content for your business? So is it relevant for your business? And I'll give a few examples there. And then fourth and finally, you know, 
as you can see here today, there's, and uh, in all these kind of conferences, there's so much content out there. What is your approach to the outside world and who are you going to partner with? So that's um, the four areas. This is just a, a, a taking a screenshot from our sales website a few weeks ago. And really what I'm trying to demonstrate here is um, some of the successful packages we've had. As you can see at the top left and, uh, hand side, we've got five pound monthly subscription boosts. And what we've found is that's worked very well for that free view audience that we mentioned earlier. So these are the audience that are not used to paying for TV. It's a big barrier to um, subscribe for pay TV channels, but we're tempting them in with low value but quality offerings. So in the example of kids, that's linear and on demand from Disney, Viacom, and Turner. So we've got all the quality content that you'd want at a low monthly price, which is currently on offer. Um, and I think the real point about this is that all the content in these packs are non-exclusive. We're simply acquiring content from lots of providers. But where we're finding is that we're a de facto exclusive because the way we're packaging it is unique, and we're packaging it uniquely for our audience. So I suppose in, in that battle for content, my first sort of salient lesson would be over and above the volume of content or the exclusivity is how you package and promote it. Uh, the second area, and this is something we've really learned over the last two and a half years, is around working more collaboratively with content owners. So I think when we started, we just simply signed the content, did our own marketing, our own distribution. And what we found more and more and more and increasingly, actually, is that a lot of content owners have an invaluable audience. And if we can tap into that, we can really drive sales and engagement. Because again, as a business, reducing churn uh, from our TV package helps to reduce churn from our overall talk talk group, which is one of the cornerstones of why um, us, like most telcos, are in uh, TV. I'll give a few examples. We licensed a channel called Box Nation last year. Um, we are not sports experts. We didn't have any necessary expectations about boxing and how it performs. What we found is that it's an, a hyper-engaged audience. We've worked with them on a few different social media campaigns, and we've really borne fruit in terms of over-indexing on our um, initial targets for what we were going to do with this channel. Uh, However, it's not just in sports content, it's also in entertainment areas. We've done a lot with Fox and Walking Dead. I think the point really is to say that as a platform, when we're looking at acquiring content in the future, we are asking the content right owners, what is your audience? How can you help us to reach this audience? And we'll talk a bit more about that in it. So building a true partnership, and I think that's uh, the second area. The third area is, does the content suit your operation? Now, it sounds very, very simple, but I'll give a couple of examples where I think you have to think very carefully about what your sales channels are and what your objectives are and tailoring the content to it. So one area is uh, that, that we have, which we're relatively fortunate with, is because we're relatively new as a pay TV provider and we don't have lots and lots of legacy, is that we can sell constant, uh, content immediately and instantly on the box. Not all providers can do that. Very natural in an OTT environment, but still unusual, uh, relatively unusual in a, a triple play provider. And you know, lo and behold, what we found is that impulse purchase has become a significant part of how we sell content. So these are people uh, you know, seeing a channel that is live and going through to buy the low cost pack and then watching immediately. So that's become increasingly a bigger and bigger area. And so A, we're focusing on marketing to let our customers know that you can impulse purchase. But secondly, um, starting to think about, okay, are, are there certain areas of content that we can go do more of to really tap into that? I think the second area is that conversely, unlike some of the OTT providers, we've got a real, uh, an estate of thousands of call center operatives. Um, now, that is much more like a traditional operator. And again, one of the things we've done with a partner called Picturebox, which is a universal-owned uh, movie library, is we've worked very carefully with them on terms of how do we promote that content for, uh, for sale in the call centers. And we work together on a script, and if you like, a five-second verbally produced elevator pitch. And things like that is actually far more powerful than um, a product which might have you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of content, but if you can't explain it in five to 10 seconds, you're not gonna make a sale in a call center. So again, two basic examples, but you know, if I was advising anyone to 
start up a new platform, I would say, you know, if you've got all this call center real estate, you don't necessarily have to have thousands of hours. You have to have something that's so easy and immediate to explain verbally as well, not visually, verbally. Uh, the fourth and final area that uh, we wanted to talk about is partners and friends. So this slide shows UView. Just to give a, a little bit of background is that uh, our platform is called UView. It's a consortium with um, all the public service broadcasters in the UK. So that's BBC, ITV, and Channel 4, and Channel 5. Uh, BT, so uh, you know, a, a partner in another telco, and uh, Arkiva. So it is a slightly unusual UK uh, quirk that we are cooperating together like this. But the, coming back to the point about knowing your partners and your friends is we've had the advantage, if you like, of an open platform for the last two and a half years. It's an open platform any partner can join. So we're quite predisposed to be actively engaged and working with partners. And so, you know, Netflix have launched the platform. Obviously, we've got BBC iPlayer, ITV Player, which is the local uh, catch-up services. Um, so I think there's two points really to make around, around this, which is, you know, there's all this content out there. We, don't we can look where do we partner rather than just try and compete. So one example is, uh, is ITV. We uh, have ITV Player on there. We know it performs very strongly. And off the back of that, one of the things we've done is work with ITV to develop a pay TV proposition. So how can we migrate customers on from free to pay? But the point is being complementary to the ITV player free to air uh, proposition, not trying to compete against it. And I think the second area is across all our boosts and portfolio. Um, our boost, sorry, is, is our word, is the talk talk word for our content pay TV packs. What we've tended to do is focus a lot on linear, because again, if you look at where the content is coming from on UView that's not, that we haven't acquired, a lot of it is on demand. So we've really tried to focus a lot on linear whilst improving our on-demand offering. And we've also tried to make sure that the genres we cover and cater for are, are genres that are not being covered for in other areas. So again, the real point around this is just to say that uh, we do now in our battle for content think very carefully about on our platform, what is already being served? And if it's already being serviced well by someone else, and our audience is happy and engaged, and hopefully churning less, then we're happy for them to do that. And we don't necessarily have to compete on every single area of content. So I think this slide is probably a good slide to conclude on. TalkTalk, Talk, as you can probably see, have a, quite a large array of content. Um, we have, you know, over 100 pay TV channels and close to 100 free-to-air channels, and thousands of hours of on-demand content available as well. But in our experience, great content alone does not achieve uh, success on its own. Even more than ever, um, there's ubiquitous amounts of content available. So what is the clear differentiator? Um, so again, if we looked at those four questions, what we would say is it's working with content owners is absolutely key, um, figuring out what their audience is, um, you know, do they have an audience? Can they help us in, in building and making sure that the content is and the product is appropriate for the sales channels? Focusing on a product which works um, for our audience and working with our partners and making sure that our audience and partners are engaged in is a key to success. So, so in summary, uh, going back to the initial question, which is the battle for content, um, in Talk Talk's world, we believe that we're uh, achieving success in a very non-exclusive content marketplace. And so we're less back battling for customers, but battling for the audience. Thank you very much.